Welcome to the Simple Steps Personal Finance Podcast, bringing personal finance to you step by step. This is episode 8. This episode is being broadcast just a couple of weeks before Christmas. Now, I'm not going to start talking about the new year just yet, but what I would like to do is offer a Christmas gift to you all. As you know, this podcast is designed to help you help yourself. For those of you who are still put off making changes by yourselves or feel that they would achieve better results by having personal guidance, I offer my personal finance coaching. So my gift to you is a discount on my current rates. For one month, covering the end of December and start of January, I will be reducing my starter package cost by 20%. Three 90-minute coaching sessions with two bonus 45-minute catch-ups will now cost only £200. That's £50 off. This package is designed to give us a generous window of three months to assess and improve your financial picture, improve your behaviours with money and help you keep more of your money each month with regular catch-ups to keep you motivated and combat any issues that you might be facing. This package can also be given to someone else as a gift, so keep it in mind as you meet with friends and family over the festive period. Helping someone gain control of their money is a gift that lasts much longer than one Christmas. This episode we are going to expand on our theme from the last few episodes. How to enhance our simple three account approach so that you can accommodate saving for expected expenses to remove the fluctuations out of your your monthly spending and put aside money for longer term goals. Expand the vision, but keep our day to day life simple, free of anxiety and confusion. Last time we talked about having a grey area where you earn more than you spend. From this leftover money, we can put aside for expenses that don't occur conveniently each month but pop up at awkward times of the year. Things like birthdays, Christmas, holidays, car insurance, home insurance, replacing furniture, things of that nature. These are all things that will be difficult to absorb from your standard monthly income and would ruin any consistent approach you're trying to maintain. So by saving into a slush fund each month, we can dip into that money to take care of these yearly one-offs as and when they occur but also keep our monthly spending on an even keel. By taking the ebb and flow out of monthly spending, we can use our monthly income in a consistent way. We can pay the same bills, spend the same on enjoying ourselves, put the same aside for future goals, invest the same amount for our later years. If we try to take each month as they occur with with no thinking ahead, then we will quickly run into trouble because each month is not the same. December has Christmas and an early payday, which makes January the longest month between payslips and usually a financially hard month because of that. Birthday months have added expenses. Summer months might see holiday spending. It would be rare for a person to be able to deal with these changes in spending that each of these months bring with them without ever overspending. By putting the same amount of money into a slush fund each month, we can maintain much more consistent spending month to month yet still have a way to deal with these irregular activities. We can also start behaviours that require us to think long term, like saving for our children. Perhaps you want to save for their education, which is a possible 18 year window, or save money to help them with a deposit for their first home, another 18 plus year window, perhaps even as much as 25 or 30 years. Would you put more money away into savings for these things if you took each month at a time and tried to keep every screaming bill happy? Or by having a balanced, thoughtful approach that looks to keep each month regular and smooth? Now anything I talk about on these podcasts comes from my own experience. Where I don't have that experience like saving for children... It comes from me walking a mile in someone else's shoes. What would I do if I were in that situation? Not what books and newspapers would suggest, ignorant of risk and human emotion. What would I do as a regular person with regular hopes, aspirations and and desires? So this idea of keeping a slush fund, adding to it each month with a regular amount 
and spending from it as irregular bills pop up. This is something I do, and I have done for at least the last four years. Living by a monthly spending plan unique to each and every month, planned out on paper, on purpose, before the month starts, has taken away a lot of the stress that buying a home brought me, the, the little niggling fears of unexpected bills popping up, like my local land rent, hikes in council tax, uh, bigger than expected gas bills over the winter. Having a slush fund off to the side, though, has virtually eradicated any leftover stress. Now I have money put aside to fund car insurance each year, home insurance, car maintenance, going on holiday, even replacing things around the house as they fail. Each month is 90% Groundhog Day. Everything ticks along nicely, no anxiety at all. I just make decisions on what is happening differently in my life for that upcoming month. Do I want more spending money for any trips I've got planned? Do I want to spend more on clothing as I, I fancy some new things? Do I need to go anywhere and need more petrol money? Will I be needing to do a bigger shop at the supermarket next month? Now my 21 year old me would have thought this is a very boring approach to life. As a grown man though, I take confidence from this level of consistency. In a way, this approach, it gives me security. It provides a bedrock for me to do all the other things in my life from. I can shop without guilt, spend without fear, and travel without running up debts. There are no obstacles to me going about living my life, however exciting or boring I want it to be that month. And by having a rainy day fund too, I can absorb moments of bad luck that may come my way. Control of my money has given me a peace of mind but it has also allowed me to flourish, make choices I previously wouldn't have been able to make. So how does this work on a practical basis? If you have a car insurance fund, a holiday fund, a helping the kids with university costs fund, a retirement fund, do you need separate accounts for all of them? And who do you keep the money with? How do you deal with all that paperwork? Let's dig into that. Well, in my experience, trying to do too many things is as bad as trying to do too few. Putting money aside, whether it's for a few weeks, a few months, or a couple of decades, takes a bit of thought to keep it simple. Here's how I break down that thinking. If it's money I expect to use in the next year, I lump it all together in one slush fund savings account. So all those irregular things that occur throughout the year, they're not regular, but they're expected and they, they happen with a, a 12 month cycle. Anything that is past a year, but less than five years, goes into a longer term savings account. Things like replacing specific bits of furniture, getting a new TV or, or a major service that the car will have due. Anything over five years becomes a question of, do I save or do I invest? Let me put this simply how I like to separate the two ideas. If I need a specific amount on a specific date, a few years in the future, then I call it saving. Like needing £1,600 to go on a planned holiday for a landmark birthday in six years time, say. If it's a more general concept of needing to have money for a later date, like helping a son or daughter with a house deposit, or saving for old age, then there's no magic number in mind. And the timeline is usually much longer than five years. In that case, I class that as investing. So what's the difference? Well, saving would require something with a known return, a level of interest that is guaranteed or fixed. This could be a savings account, like a, an instant access, cash ISA, paying 1.5%, or a two-year fixed interest account, paying 2.5%, or a three-year fixed bond, paying 3% a year. By having a concrete amount that you know will be paid, you can back into your target easily. After all, it's just maths that tell you how much you need to put away each month at 3% interest to have £1,600 in six years' time. There's lots of calculators that'll do that for you if you Google them. On the other hand, you have investing. No known end number with a long-term view. What are we aiming for? We want to put money in and have it grow by as much as possible, right? Not, not knowing how much we may need in the future. We just want what we put in 
to become the most it can be. So we look at things like the stock market or property where long-term returns have been, on average, much higher than everything else. It's hard to put money away into property month by month with any real success, so you may look to drip feed money into the stock market instead through something like an index tracker. Now, this is an investment that mirrors the performance of a stock exchange. So a simple example would be the FTSE 100, the UK stock exchange, which is valued by the UK's 100 largest companies. This is the one that you see read out on the news each night, the value of the FTSE today. FTSE is the FTSE 100 stock exchange. If the value of those companies goes up by 5%, the FTSE 100 goes up by 5%. If the value of those 100 companies falls by 2%, then FTSE falls by 2%. An index tracker just mirrors that performance by buying bits of each of those 100 companies. In turn, you can buy the tracker and benefit when those companies rise by 5% and suffer along with the market when they fall by 2%. As the FTSE 100 has averaged around 5.5% after fees over the last 20 years, outperforming cash, which returned under 3%, and that's despite a a dot-com tech boom and a global financial crisis, the stock market tends to do well over long time horizons. So my investment for retirement is heavily involved in things like these index trackers. I may mix up the geography a bit to benefit from the USA, Europe and the Far East all having large economic power, but the principle is the same. I follow the stock markets for long-term investing. Let's recap that then. I can save for the next year or two in one account and invest for the next 20 or 30 years in another. That doesn't sound too difficult then. Lots of different goals are being met, lots of jobs that I'd like the money to perform, Yet my interaction with it is pretty straightforward. Make a monthly contribution to each of them. Use one of them, the savings, to take the sting out of expensive months. Leave the other one, the investments, untouched until I want to stop working and sip cocktails on a beach somewhere or something of that nature. And account each for soon and much later. So I started this episode by saying we'd find a way to improve our three account structure and not make things more and more confusing. Now hopefully you're starting to see how that can be done. We had a couple of other accounts off to the side, have little interaction with them day to day, but benefit from their existence. Let me paint that picture then. What do we already have? We have a current account for paying bills and receiving income to. That's account number one. We have a current account for doing our day to day spending. That's account two. We have a savings account, likely a cash ISA, where we keep our rainy day fund, instantly accessible in case there's an emergency, otherwise it's it's doing nothing. It's just our insurance against life. That's account number three. Now let's expand for today's things. We open another savings account, probably best as instant access, to put money away for irregular bills, our slush fund for soon to happen stuff. So that savings account, that's account four. We might set up a standing order to put money into that account each month and then transfer out ad hoc when stuff happens, but it can be largely untouched. Account 5 would be an investment account or a pension policy or a stocks and shares ISA, something designed for longer term investing. We'd put money in each month by direct debit or standing order bank transfers and we'd look to not touch that for long stretches of times. Years, most likely. It could even be decades. So five accounts. Two that we think about and use in day-to-day living. Two that are there to help us when times get out of the ordinary or even downright chaotic. And one to make sure we keep our dignity and live out our life in the way we hope to in a couple of decades' time. Now you may be thinking that five accounts sounds less than simple, but really just one of them is with you when you're shopping or buying coffee in the morning or going for a night out. One of them helps you plan everything once a month. One of them keeps your money separate for when you have strange bills. One of them is there in case you have an emergency. And one is there for your future self, the older, wiser 
better luck in you. That's simple enough, isn't it? You still saying no? Okay, okay. Uh, how does this sound? Here's how I look at it. I have jotted down on a piece of paper my financial blueprint. It's just five circles. Two at the top, two in the middle, one at the bottom. Now the two at the top are my current accounts, my bills and spending. The middle two are my savings accounts, slush fund and the rainy day fund. And the bottom one is my pension account. Now the Olympics logo is just five rings, right? That's a nice simple design. Well, as it turns out, so is my financial blueprint. It's just five rings too. I can see very quickly that all my aims are being met, but I don't need to do anything. Everything is set up to accommodate automatic instructions and keep me concentrated on my day-to-day -day living and once a month bill paying. Just those two accounts at the top. Simple. As life goes on, it gets more complicated with mortgages, kids' savings accounts, maybe school fees or university costs, saving to buy cars or help with house deposits. It will be easy to overthink the complexity of these things. That's why having a financial blueprint helps. Lots of rings on a page to remind you where the money sits and how it all ties together with your goals. But your day-to-day -day world stays focused and uncluttered. Just two accounts cover these things. If you tie your financial blueprint to a list of account names and what that money is meant for, it's very, very clear to you. At this point, I'd say you're living well, you're in control of your money, you're changing your life, and your future is your own creation. Next time, I want to expand on why automating as much of this good behaviour is essential to keeping you on track, and why checking your behaviour every now and then will keep you from picking up any bad habits. In the meantime though, check out my blog at sspf.co.uk slash blog for more financial common sense. Don't forget to spread the word, financial peace of mind is here to stay. Simple Steps and my personal finance coaching are here to help. If you are finding this approach useful but are unsure on how to act, drop me a line. See how personal finance coaching can help you. After all, what could be better than having personal guidance tailored to your circumstances? Thanks for listening. That's it for episode 8. For more information, check out sspf.co.uk for show notes and transcripts of each episode. This podcast is copyright of Simple Steps Personal Finance Limited and can be shared freely. The SSPF podcast is available as direct download on Android, RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Vimeo and Dailymotion. We're here however you want it. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a review so others know to listen in too. Thanks as always to partners in life for the music used throughout this podcast. See you next time.